space might be the final frontier, but it's also Earth's giant garbage can. And that can is very quickly filling up. Ever since humanity first ventured into the dark, silent unknown of our exosphere, we've left traces, satellites, space stations, shuttles, and all kinds of debris. Over the years, without any formal regulation to keep our activities at bay, just like LA traffic, space has become awfully congested. And with every forgotten satellite circling our Earth, hundreds of millions of dollars is left abandoned, to the total tune of nearly half a trillion. Why is that number so high? And more importantly, why should we care? We're all the way down here, and it's all the way up there. Well, perhaps it won't be that way for much longer. If you've ever stared up at the stars on a dark, clear night, you've probably witnessed lights floating through our atmosphere. Oh wow, a satellite. Uh, not quite. Odds are that what you're actually looking at is a useless, forgotten, now dangerous piece of what's known as space junk. Today, the European Space Agency estimates that there are roughly 166 million man-made objects up there, unmonitored and uncontrolled. Sure, space junk includes abandoned spacecrafts, parts of rockets, and satellites whose only modern use is to collect space dust, but there's much more than that. Tiny flecks of paint, for example, flecks so small that they're nearly invisible, are also counted as space junk. While they might seem irrelevant, as we'll soon discuss, even the microscopic junk can be harmful. Nah, destructive. Nah, actually deadly. Sitting at altitudes of 500 miles, space junk will remain a threat for decades to come. Only then will it start to decay, falling back to Earth into one of our oceans. How much space junk is legitimately out there? Is it something that we need to really be worrying about? Sorry to tell all you future astronauts, but yep, it definitely is. First of all, keep in mind that there are around 2,000 active satellites orbiting Earth at this very moment, with most of them sitting in these two regions, the thermosphere and the exosphere. These satellites are used every day and are crucial to our communications and navigation. 2,000 active satellites suggest that our pathway to space is already jam-packed with human-made devices, but it gets even more crowded when you take into account the outdated and forgotten technology. There are close to 3,000 dead satellites littering space. What's more, according to the Natural History Museum, there are around 34,000 pieces of space junk bigger than 4 inches in size and millions, even tens of millions of pieces of microscopic shrapnel flying around like bullets. And mark our words, this interstellar collection of deserted technology racks up quite a heavy expenditure bill. The typical weather satellite costs about $290 million to build. If each one of those larger man-made objects was, in fact, a weather satellite, then the total value of just the large junk would soar to, hold on to your oxygen tanks people, 435 billion. Just to put that into perspective, NASA's entire budget for 2020 was $22.6 billion. That's just 5% of the value of the wasted trash circling our atmosphere. 435 billion. It's almost hard to comprehend, and yet that number is still, to be fully frank, pretty conservative. Considering that weather satellites are rather cheap compared to other types of satellites, that number could realistically be closer to a trillion dollars. NISAR, which will be the first radar imaging satellite to use dual frequencies, and which has scheduled a launch date of 2022, has a total cost of $1.5 billion on its own. So just imagine the value of machinery that will be circling our planet in 10 years time. While all those numbers are, well, astronomical, they only take into account the value of the objects. We're still forgetting about the absurd amounts of money spent to physically propel these items into space in the first place. Whether they're catapulting satellites, rockets, space shuttles, or rovers, the cost of sending material into orbit is enough to make any accountant squirm. It costs about $10,000 per pound to launch something out of our atmosphere. So what does that mean in greater terms? Well, if there's nearly 2,000 tons of space junk floating around up there as we speak, then we've already spent 40 billion bucks just to slingshot outdated trash into the atmosphere. It's already a substantial amount of capital going to waste, but the reality is that those numbers are only going in one direction, up. More than 5,000 rocket launches have placed satellites into orbit since the start of the space race in 1957. Since then, the space race has diverged. Now, not only are the likes of NASA sending material up into the atmosphere, private companies are getting in on the action too. You've all heard of SpaceX, right? Elon Musk has plans to transport all of us off into the dark abyss. We might be colonizing Mars sooner than we think, but that's not all that SpaceX has been up to. 
Musk has rapidly built up the so-called Starlink constellation, growing it to include nearly 800 internet-providing satellites. 800 makes Starlink already the largest satellite constellation in existence. However, the final design anticipates upwards of 12,000 more to be added to the network. That's more than double the total number of satellites that have been launched over the past 70 years. It's not just SpaceX, either. Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin has plans, ready for this, to build a village on the moon. It goes without saying, that the materials needed to make that happen would monumentally increase the already problematic levels of space junk. Where does a moon-based civilization dispose of their household trash? You can't simply burn it. There's no oxygen on the moon, after all. The intent to penetrate space extends far beyond the cluster of private companies and government entities in the USA. In China, for example, Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology, also known as iSpace, became the first private Chinese company to launch a satellite into space as recently as 2020 and they're just one of many. Unlike this time 70 years ago, the concepts of infiltrating and inhabiting space are much more than wishful dreams and creative ideas. They're undisputed realities, and we're slowly making our way toward them, one satellite at a time. But if it's already crowded, if we've already got a half a trillion dollars worth of useless metals drifting around up there, then what happens when it truly gets overcrowded? What happens when we pass the point of no return? The more crowded it gets, the higher the chance of space junk hurling itself into an active satellite, or worse, a manned space shuttle. That fear isn't new. In fact, something called the Kessler Syndrome Theory was originally put forward way back in 1978. Here's the Kessler Syndrome explained in a nutshell. Once we surge past a certain critical mass of space junk in the galaxy, the total amount of debris will irreversibly increase. There will be no turning back. Why? Because more debris means more collisions. More collisions means more debris. More debris means more collisions, and so on and so forth. It's a vicious chain reaction, and it could make space travel near impossible. Imagine trying to cross a busy highway on foot, except that highway is the Earth's atmosphere, and the cars are tiny pieces of space junk flying violently in every direction. Have you guys seen Gravity? In that Oscar-winning film, satellite shrapnel caused a cascade of disastrous outer space collisions. That is the Kessler Syndrome in effect. Clear as day. So the question isn't if we'll reach a critical mass and find ourselves in the shoes of Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, but when. But how has all this become a problem? How have we reached a stage where so much trash, and in effect, so much money, is left out in the dark depths of space to sit and slowly decay? Part of the problem is that outer space remains largely unregulated. No rules, no worries. Over 50 years ago, an international agreement was signed, but there's been no significant policing of this agreement, and due to its age, it's hastily become outdated. If there's no major shift in regulation, then before we know it, Earth could be transformed into an extraterrestrial wasteland. Some experts are warning that areas of low Earth orbit have already reached a critical mass of congestion. Within those areas, pieces of debris can travel around at absurd speeds. Even fingernail-sized pieces of shrapnel can zoom through our skies with an impact velocity of 6 miles per second. That's almost 22,000 miles per hour. It's easy to imagine a deadly chain reaction. But if you can't imagine it for yourself, the head of the Europe European Space Agency's Space Debris Office put it oh so eloquently. A one centimeter piece has the kinetic energy of an exploding grenade. For all of us down here on Earth, though, it's a case of out of sight, out of mind. While some pieces of space junk will fall toward Earth, the odds of us personally being hit by falling space junk is about 70 trillion to one. You have a much better chance of winning the lottery, and we all know how often that happens. Even though we'd all love to be rolling in the dough, let's get back to the point. Who can we hold responsible? To the letter of the law, who technically owns space? The answer is, well, nobody. Even though Neil Armstrong famously planted that American flag on the moon in 1969, it was nothing more than a symbolic gesture. At that point, the moon didn't become American property, because two years earlier, in 1967, the internationally recognized Outer Space Treaty was signed. 129 countries, including China, Russia, the UK, and the US, have committed to this treaty, which is overseen by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Simply put, no single nation can lay claim to the moon or Mars, or any asteroid, or any star. Space is a dangerously mesmerizing playground for each and every one of us. So if it really is out of sight and out of mind, then why is it relevant? Why should we care? Believe it or not, our daily lives rely on outer space. Every phone call, every tweet, every navigation, every Uber or Lyft you order, it all relies on satellite technology. If you use a cell phone, then you use satellites. And all that space junk you can't see will be affecting you every single day if it all goes haywire. 
Before too long, however, you might actually be able to see it for yourself. A number of companies are knee-deep in progress to launch commercial trips to the upper atmosphere and outer space. Virgin Galactic, for example, will take you to the 62-mile-high Kármán line for a cool $250,000. Would you board a plane headed for outer space? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the richest, and have a great day. Catch you next time.